Uh, next speaker is uh, Morten Kieter, and I'm very happy that he is here. He's one of my colleagues from Zuka, so this year I'm not the only one from Zuka presenting here at the Riot Summit. Um, Morten works for Zuka um, much longer than I do, for uh, almost four years now. Uh, we're actually working on the same project. Um, right now he has experience as a software developer for um, more than 10 years in very diverse fields. Um, He's um, an experienced uh, web framework developer as well. And in his presentation, he will talk a little bit about um, how um, he used uh, Google protocol buffers in a, a project um, for um, a medical device, so a field pair, um, which is not exactly um, known to be very liberal and, uh, and, and open for things like open source development, um, but uh, actually the uh, use of um, the uh, Open source group protocol buffers uh, was a success story in this, in this context. And um, Mark now will show us how, how we made it possible or how we made it possible to, to use it in this uh, context and how this uh, facilitates uh, um, the development of the, of the project. This one Okay, there we go. Okay, there it is yours. Okay, thank you. Maybe this works. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, hi. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Oliver. Um, yeah, in the spirit of honesty, first off, I am a total uh, Riot newbie, uh, also pretty new to the IoT space. Um, however, uh, after talking with Oliver and learning more about it and being asked to do this presentation, I have to say I'm very impressed about the community as well as the technology itself. Hope I have the chance to use it in the future. Um, and this talk is not originally designed for IoT, but I think it uh, fits quite well because it talks about the communication technologies in the space of embedded. Um, and it was designed for 45 minutes. I'm going to be doing my best. I relatively quickly compressed it down to 20 to 25. I promise you I'm keeping the best distilled version that I can. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Um, okay, yeah, so at uh, Zulke, we are an embedded consultancy. We work with uh, clients from uh, all over Europe, uh, actually now all over the world. Of all different shapes and sizes. We work on projects of all shapes and sizes, uh, pure software projects, hardware, as well as, of course, various integration projects. And uh, the one thing that all of our customers have in common is, to be honest, everything. They want uh, their ideas and their projects done to spec. They want them delivered on time. They want them delivered on budget. To be honest, they would like it under budget. Um, <laughs> And of course, all the bells and whistles on top uh, focus on security, uh, safety, uh, CI, CD, testing, et cetera, the list goes on. And as I'm sure all of you are well aware, the best way to handle such a situation is not to write everything yourself, but to use off-the-shelf solutions wherever appropriate, whether that be proprietary middleware or, if possible, um, open source solutions. And as Oliver already said, uh, this is about uh, an integration uh, of a open source technology and a medical device project uh, run for at Zulke. And um, yeah, sorry, it's not Riot, it's Google Protocol Buffers. Um, this uh, is not a new technology, um, I'm going to come to that uh, later, but uh, I think it's a relatively novel use of it uh, as said, in a space where usually you don't have open source technologies directly in the firmware. And um, yeah, the last thing I'll say here is, I'm sorry, I know it's not the Google logo, but when I was asking for permission to use the various logos in my presentation, the only company to deny my request was, go figure, Google. <laughs> <laughs> and then OPD I'm going to come back to later. So, a uh, super quick overview, basically two sections. I'm going to talk about the technology itself, um, what are some peers and alternatives, uh, what it looks like for embedded, uh, et cetera. And then I'm going to switch over to project integration and tool, okay, um, why did we choose it, how did we do it, and of course, lessons learned. So, uh, what is it? Um, uh, in fancy words, it's a portable data interchange format for data serialization across machine boundaries. Uh, machine boundaries can be anything, of course, not more popular like network boundaries, as you would see in something like Riot, um, or uh, between microcontrollers or across memory, et cetera. Um, and at its core, it's a specified wire exchange format. That's really the key uh, how to efficiently encode the data over the wire. Um, Google does provide their own full tool set to, to handle this and to integrate this in various languages under the BSD license, but the point here to make is implementation is not mandated. So uh, why would you use it without comparing it to anything else? Um, it's very language and platform portable. Even if uh, Google itself does not provide it in their toolkit, uh, there are um, third-party solutions for pretty much any language out there. As I said, this is already a mature technology. Um, 
you have full scalar type data coverage, meaning basically anything you want to send over the wire, you can do it in a pretty simple manner. Um, it's wire size efficient uh, and it's runtime efficient or fast runtime performance, but I would say in other case, optimal. It's more of a balance between different factors. Um, and you could look at it as a basis for a simple, uh, or any sort of remote procedure protocol system, or even as the glue for a custom quasi stack, you know, sort of between the data link layer up to the session. Um, important point to make here is the uh, documentation is absolutely excellent. It's very easy to understand both the uh, wire format itself as well as the tools coming from Google. And there are no magic tricks involved here. Uh, what you see is what you get. It has a very straightforward spec. It's readable for I think anybody with any experience in this area. So, but what is it not? Um, you don't get uh, features of a higher level setup. You don't get encryption, decryption, compression. You don't have a RPC framework built in. <coughs> there might have been some alternatives. But the point is these things can all be added. And in fact, they're usually things you might want to customize more for your project anyways. And the other important point to make is this is not a self-describing format. What that means is you have to have the data contract available on uh, each end of the, the communication setup. Um, to understand what the data over the wire means. You can't just look at the data and understand it. So now let's uh, compare it briefly. Um, what are some things that could straight out more or less replace? Uh, serialization is nothing new. Um, since the first uh, computers started spitting up data, we had to serialize it in some way. Uh, there are more traditional tried and true methods that have been around for a while, things like SOAP, CORBA, COM, DCOM. Um, some of these are, well, these are all very flexible and comprehensive, so to say, but some of them may be more heavyweight uh, to integrate and to use unless you already have experience with them. And they're not necessarily language or platform neutral. On the other hand, you have uh, more popularly uh, data, so-called data uh, format serialization solutions, things like JSON and XML, which often appear in web applications. For instance, um, these are all very highly portable. Any language out there pretty much has a good, stable JSON uh, parsing library. Um, they're also more or less human readable, which makes it relatively easy for debugging. I wouldn't say it's enjoyable, but it's possible. However, on the other side, none of these things, it's not really cheap when you talk about embedded space. It's not cheap to parse, to encode, etc. It does not make it ideal for such a space. There are some direct peers that have appeared since Google protocol buffers became popular. I don't really have time today to talk about them. I'm just going to mention one of them would be Apache Thrift from an ex-Googler. Also become relatively mature at this point. Something a bit newer, Apache Abro. These are both uh, open source solutions. Um, and if I were to briefly compare it to you, similar feature set, um, you have uh, similar performance. Also, the major difference being that I still think Google Protocol is a bit more mature when it comes to documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, easier to get up and running. Um, though I don't have personally a lot of experience with these. An entirely different class that's become more popular in recent years of, of serialization formats have actually been spawned from protocol buffers, so to say. Uh, these are so-called zero-copy serialization formats, the idea being why do you need to encode or decode at all? You can do this faster if you actually do intelligent padding and essentially send your data straight over the wire, memory mapping it from one architecture to another. Um, there are different ways to do this, of course. Uh, I mentioned a few, or at least the popular examples I'm aware of. Here, uh, for instance, Captain Proto is actually directly from the author of the uh, B2 uh, protocol buffers uh, release, or the first one was released to the public. So he has a lot of experience in the space and said, how can I make this faster? How can I do this differently? So by their nature, they're all faster than Google protocol buffers. Um, however, you do have to be aware of the gotchas, um, mainly being that they're not as efficient over the wire. Uh, in fact, with Captain Proto, he actually built in uh, options that allow you to turn off the zero copy uh, attributes of the system to become more similar to Google protocol buffers. Um, then you always, of course, have the popular embedded choice. You can make your own. Um, there are some serious advantages to this and very good reasons to do this. You can always specify just what you need. You can make it faster. You can make it smaller. Um, however, yeah, you have to be aware of what's under the water if you look at it as an iceberg. Um, maybe it's appropriate, but if you have a larger system, maybe you end up spending more money in the long run doing such a thing. So, switching back to just for Google protocol buffers, uh, super short history. It's been around for, since 2001 internally at Google, where they were replacing, replacing yet another uh, internal serialization format. Um, you'll see it used all over Google's uh, services as a sort of glue. Uh, you can see this in Google Maps if you start looking at the links. Um, it was released open source in 2008, very stable at that point already, full feature. And, um, yeah, actually, I just include a link here of somebody that found uh, was awarded five thousand uh, dollars for an XSS exploit, where he actually uh, basically backward engineered uh, 
uh, how the Google Maps uh, links work and it was through Google protocol buffers that he figured it out and could actually drop pins on other people's uh, Google Maps widgets on their websites. Let's find it interesting. It was a very detailed explanation. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, at the front end of Google protocol buffers, you have what's called an IDL, Interface Definition Language, basically a fancy name for a domain-specific language. Um, this allows them to define, or for you to define your data contract specific to your, your, your setup. Um, this is, there have been two versions of this, uh, Proto2 and Proto3. Um, at at Zulco, on our project, we used Proto2. Um, that was already full-featured. Um, it simply was the only thing available at the time, and to be honest, we stuck with it. We had a, no real reason to switch. Proto3 is mostly about simplifying things. Uh, for details, you have to look. We don't have time today. But um, yeah, like I mentioned, the files have a .proto suffix, um, and then Google provides tools in the form of a compiler to take this interface language, which I'll show you in a second, to boilerplate code that you then use for your decoding and encoding together with runtime libraries running on, for instance, your device. Um, very simple to read and write. Uh, here's a trivial example, an artificial one that I kind of threw together. Uh, the system that makes requests to a remote server, for instance, and then re uh, receives a response made up of multiple results at some point later. Um, as you can see, it's not really worth it, but um, you have the ability to import other proto files with other definitions to save you time. Uh, you define enums for clarity and for type safety. And then the core is then you define these messages uh, with different fields, different well-known data types, uh, instance, uh, integer tools, etc. And then you have to have a unique identifier for this because built into Google specification is uh, sort of a, a backwards compatibility versioning scheme. And here you make a request. Um, you get a series of results that are then packaged together with this repeated keyword in one response package. That means you can combine messages and nest them inside of each other. Um, and I, of course, there's a few more details, but I would say right here already this is enough to get started with how the interface looks like. So, okay, uh, I don't really have probably time for this today, but talking about the wire format, as I've already said, it's pretty straightforward and clear. This picture already encompasses the majority of the specification for the, the wire format. There are actually only four major types of data that are sent over the wire uh, very, very variable yeah. integers, an efficient encoding scheme for integers. Uh, strings, uh, a fixed 32 type, which I'll come back to later, um, why, where you can say I will always use four bytes for this field, and then things like the repeated uh, entry I showed you before, more or less a, a list scheme. And uh, you have some overhead bytes in here for sizing and for tagging your data, but as I said, it's uh, pretty clear. And you have also support for things like floats uh, and doubles, etc. But, okay, with all this described, um, you don't want to use Google's toolset as nice as it is, as well documented as it is. Uh, it was de designed for the application space, and uh, you'll see that it uh, makes heavy use of the SDL, dynamic allocation, and you're really looking at about the start 100 kilobytes of, of ROM. In a lot of cases, that's already a no-go. Um, pretty much in all cases, if you're talking about embedded, you could try to strip it down as possible, but it's really not the, the idea of the whole thing. Uh, however, hope is not lost, of course, this is the open source community, people are very resourceful and uh, already various uh, people have uh, gotten together and created C libraries for this as third party implementations according to the Google spec. In fact, many of these have already become deprecated. There are two major active ones at the moment. Um, one I'll just briefly mention is Protobox C, uh, designed to be very full featured, uh, or rather uh, following uh, Google specification with all the features included. Uh, it still by default makes use of dynamic allocations, although you can configure this. Um, but you're looking at about 20 kilobytes of ROM, and for such a subsystem that is important, but shall we say relatively small, it's still pretty heavyweight, actually. But there is another good solution. Uh, this is one we used at Zulka, uh, known as NanoPB. This is the logo from the first slide. It um, has a lot of nice features to it. Uh, in particular, the license it comes with is a ZLib license, which is very permissive. Uh, this when you're dealing with clients makes your life easier, of course. Um, it's fully static by default. Um, you're actually looking at only between 2 and 10 kilobytes of ROM, depending on how you can configure them. I would say it is practical to get by with 2 kilobytes. Um, and you're looking at about 300 bytes of RAM at runtime, which is not nothing, but is, is uh, possible. Um, as, I said, well, as I'm saying, basically, it does favor small size over serialization speed, although that does not mean it's a slouch. If you compare it to instance for, to Protobuf C, which has a different uh, focus, you're really only talking about 30% uh, 
slower in terms of performance. And I, from our experience, it, it can do the trick, definitely. Various details that are specific to the, the static nature of this, um, but the other thing I'll say right now is it has very complete documentation, similar to Google Protocol buffers. It's very professionally done. You can get up and running within a few hours and be able to start sending messages across your, your boundaries. And it has very good unit test coverage in the, the box, which helps with the sense of confidence, of course. So then, um, once again, it may sound crazy, but uh, you have a spec. You can write your own implementation of Google protocol buffers. I included a link here, an example of a group that did just that because they were sending so many messages, tens of thousands of messages in a short time span. And it actually worked out very well for them. They saw a large performance speed up in comparison to, um, for instance, NanoPB or ProtoBuffC. Um, and for their use case, fit better. They only needed a very small feature set. But still, before you do this, you should think, this is really what I need. There's a really good reason I'm doing this, like all things in software engineering. OK, so that was a pretty quick version of it. Um, let's say, uh, so that's uh, the overview. I think enough of that. Now let me switch gears and talk about the integration in the project at Zulke. Once again, a medical device project, a relatively large one, I would say. Um, and when we started, the reasons that we did this, uh, we knew straight off we didn't want something heavyweight like XML or JSON, even though, to be honest, our client would have expected so that sort of thing. Um, we also definitely did not want to do our own custom specification uh, or custom serialization specification. The main reason being that we needed portability. We knew we were going to be running code across multiple platforms, multiple architectures, and C Sharp, C, C++, and Java. We didn't want to have to write this thing multiple times. If we had something off the shelf, that would save us time. And from a size perspective, we were running on uh, mid, well, let's say we had to be able to run on mid-range microcontrollers, not the smallest of the small, but something reasonable. And this was the first time for our customer that they would be considering uh, running open source directly in the firmware, although they, of course, had used that already for tooling and other projects. So we had to be able to sell it to them. And we were a little bit lucky that we had open minds on the other side. But once again, the license, when we looked at NetLPB, made it a perfect fit. So what, uh, what about our scenario constraints? Of course, I can't really talk about details of the project, but in a very abstract sense, we were looking to be able to call remote procedures on uh, different, uh, different controllers. Um, and uh, yeah, with a host application, or actually multiple host applications running in C Sharp and Java, um, and with services running on a master controller, as well as a hard time, real time controller. I'll come to that just in a second. Um, or actually, no, I'll go ahead. Um, our main controller had soft real-time requirements as more of an orchestration controller, having a lot of various hats, so to say. Um, therefore, it was also uh, a bit more powerful with plenty of ROM, about one megabyte, uh, RAM 256 kilobytes, and running a proprietary middleware embedded operating system. Sorry, not right. Um, <laughs> was an easier sell in that case. Um, and then uh, we have a, a, a real-time uh, calculation controller running the core IP of the customer, and this is kind of a weird custom microcontroller, uh, definitely not as powerful, 256 kilobytes of RAM and ROM <coughs> together, very tight real-time requirements in our case, and because of that, we decided no operating system. I think actually in retrospect, it would have been better off using something very small, uh, something similar maybe to Riot. Um, and all of them, didn't, as I said, connected to a PC host uh, through a USB over UART or between the two controllers over UART. So um, how did we then decide to integrate this? Um, besides, of course, the, the necessary libraries and tooling, et cetera, we built our own tooling for um, generation. And at uh, Zulke, I think we have a culture of building reusable assets, sort of internal uh, middleware, so to say, that can be used across projects. We've had big success with this when it comes uh, specifically in the tooling space. Um, we use two uh, methodologies in particular. One of these is Diesel from our da very own Daniel Mühle, which is an approach to writing lightweight DSLs in Ruby. And then the other one is uh, Gaudi from uh, our toolsmith Vasilis, uh, which is built, well, it's a build system extension built on top of Ruby and Rake that's very flexible for writing your own to uh, tooling for whatever needs you actually have. And in this case, we were using it to uh, create our own DSL um, specific to our system um, that then would be converted uh, into system definitions that would be available across all of the, the platforms, as well as services that would be then platform specific and would be more or less mapped to one or more modules running on the different systems. Um, this is a super simple example, and as you see, it's more or less a wrapper around Google protocol buffers with the same idea of enums, uh, we call them commands and notifications, but basically messages. 
uh, we have our own versioning scheme and we have uh, IDs built into our services that we name for addressing. A um, few other details, but it's also very simple, very straightforward, lightweight. And um, yeah, so then the idea was uh, basically generate everything that we could for, of course, the sake of code dupl duplication, avoiding bugs, efficiency, etc. And the idea there, taking the DSL, first of all, directly writing out protobuf, uh, the protobuf IDL, the interface definition language, uh, then um, passing that on to the protobuf compiler with extensions from Python that are from NanoPB to generate the C NanoPB structs with some special magic on top for our project. And then the other side, of course, is then writing C++ boilerplate uh, for um, clean integration with our application layer for decoding and encoding. Uh, this is actually pretty straightforward, basically at the end, going down to a function call. And uh, once that worked, we developed our own custom serialization spec, uh, very, very, very lightweight, not something more like what I understand now with co-op. Um, uh, you can, of course, integrate Google protocol buffers with whatever stack you want. In our case, we basically created a custom uh, meta format between two different protobuf pa packages. I haven't really seen this done elsewhere from what I've seen on the internet, but the idea being there's no separator in between these. The first packet is the header with uh, information for integrity and addressing, etc., and then the payload itself. And the idea is with all the libraries that we use, you have the ability to either directly encode an entire packet with the, the contract specified that would be used for the payload, and then we were also able to individually encode the fields, encode and decode the fields in the header. I'll come back to why that's useful later, but it also made the packet structure very simple. And then more or less, as you see, you have a, we used a, outside of the packet structure, zero byte terminators. Um, we did this for sake of cleanliness. It actually worked out quite well. Uh, of course, the limitation being then you have to handle zero bytes inside of your data. We did this using uh, a scheme or an algorithm that you can find in the wiki. I included the link here. It's just an overhead byte stuffing. Basically, run length encoding of your zero bytes. Um, the details you can look in wiki for it, but it's quite simple and, and straightforward. And the nice thing about this allows you to define packets of whatever size you want. Um, you only have an overhead of one, minimum overhead of one byte per packet, and the bigger <coughs> size of your packet, uh, upwards of uh, the number of bytes divided by 254. This is actually, from what I've seen in most cases, pretty similar to a, a, a run length, or not run length, sorry, a, a packet size encoded scheme. Um, uh, on both the good and bad side, uh, errors require you to do a full resend. This is very nice from an application handling standpoint, but of course it means if you send a lot of large packets uh, across a um, setup that has a high failure rate, then you are wasting a lot of cycles. But in our case, working with the UART, we didn't actually have a very high rate of failure, and this did not actually pose a problem for us. Uh, then you also have to consider uh, packet integrity, of course, you know, the CRC 32-bit scheme, um, the things to mention here with the functionality of uh, the libraries, as I mentioned, and being able to encode, encode individual fields, we were able to calculate a CRC over the entire packet already encoded without the CRC, and then after the fact, directly encode our CRC into a fixed 32 type. Um, this is this fixed four byte value that allows us to know exactly where the CRC would be and how large it would be making all this very easy and possible. And uh, yeah, the rest of the steps are pretty standard, um, like encoding it and reversing it to check the integrity. Uh, you also, of course, have to worry about, as a minimum, stream integrity. Um, it's not enough just to know that the packet is correct. You have to make sure it's the correct packet. Of course, as I said, we have that in the header in the form of uh, sequence IDs uh, with a framing scheme. And basically, then we could uh, create our own custom ACMAC packet so separate from the main packets uh, that we were sending encoded for protocol buffers. This was also encoded in protocol buffers itself uh, with its own special header that was just the CRC together with the sequence ID that we were verifying. Actually, from a bandwidth and performance standpoint, that works quite well. Uh, okay, I believe that slide, but basically then the uh, uh, encoding decoding scheme is very simple. You just look for the next zero byte in your stream, you pull it out, you check for integrity, validity, you look where where am I uh, sending to this to, which service, which module, and then you make uh, a switch statement and jump to a function call. But actually very clean and easy. So lessons learned. Um, I think straight off I can say that the reliability from using a mature, uh, well-defined uh, pro protocol or wire syntax like Google protocol buffers does save a lot of time. We never had bugs or problems um, using that. Um, also from the standpoint of nano, it's a great implementation. 
documentation. It's very solid. It's very efficient. Very understandable. Um, the custom lightweight RPC that I just showed you was more than enough for our use case, and I think would work in a lot of use cases. I'm not sure about IoT per se, but was quite good for uh, embedded project directly running on just local microcontrollers. The Zlib license, as I said, I would say what we found was very nice. Having a permissive license, uh, no doubt. Um, uh, comparing that to Riot using LGPL, I totally understand why Riot uses that. It. It's perfect uh, as a library, but for our needs, working with a customer made our life definitely a lot easier. Um, the documentation, once again, is excellent, both for protocol buffers, wire format, as well as NanoPV. Uh, you don't need to peek in the box and look at the source code. Maybe you want to. There's always a good reason for that. But And when you do, you'll find it's not that scary. It's well written. It's very clean. It's straightforward. Um, on the flip side, of course, we definitely had more flexibility and features than we needed at the end of the day. Um, it's efficient, but not optimal. A good example for embedded is that uh, this fixed 32 type is a minimum of three or four bytes. Uh, often you want one byte or two bytes. That would have been nice to have, but light uh, unfortunately, is not in the, in the spec. And then really quickly, um, I want to say a few things to uh, or about open source. Um, working in these projects, if you have a good project, or rather if you have a, a large project that's well maintained with a lot of curation and good documentation and unit tests, etc., it of course can seem like a perfect fit out of the box. No doubt it can save you time, but you have to consider a couple of questions. Is free always appropriate? Um, first of all, you have to consider the licensing model, not just what licensing model, but the fact that over time you can change. A group or a company can decide to take something that was originally in one form and switch it to another. And then if you're working, for instance, with an IoT project with thousands of devices in the field, receiving regular updates, and there's a critical fix, and you don't have immediate access to it without paying money, that can become a real problem, and that can scare off customers. And the other thing that you have to consider is, especially for a medical device project, is you definitely need to worry about verification. And verification does not come for free. So you have to then see whether it's going to be a temporary choice uh, and or rather, it's going to be a permanent choice if the customer decides to pay for the verification and include it long term, or will you end up having to rewrite it anyways? The nice thing about something like protocol buffers is you have a well defined spec, like I said. You can write your own things. So you can start off, get up and running, and then later, if you need to, um, recreate it and you already know how it works, so to say, at that point. And uh, one last word um, speaking about the nature of the free nature of open source uh, for the maintainers. Um, I think everybody here appreciates that open source is often more or less free and free to use, and that's both for the people that are creating and maintaining it as well as, of course, for the users. Um, but for larger projects or long-running projects that require a lot of curation, the question is always, uh, how do you handle this without being receiving money? And I actually here included a link to the creator of Protobox C, not NanoPD, but the other C library, uh, where he talks about this, and he's been working on this for years. He said that because he wanted to, he didn't expect to make money of it. From this, but what he found is from the beginning on his website, he put me a, put a buy me a beer button, and since then, he's never got enough money to actually get drunk. And for him, um, yeah, it's okay, but at the same time, he has to ask, How long can you keep doing this? So he's looking at alternatives like keeping the core free, but actually based on feature requests, adding new things and, and, and charging money for them. So it's a good idea or not, but I'll leave that up to you. And then I'm just going to say quick words about Zulke. Um, I've been at Zulke now for four years. I can say it's a great place to work from my personal standpoint. Um, it's actually been around for multiple decades. It's fully owned by the partners. Um, we have teams now around the world. Of course, we focus in Europe, but also teams in Singapore and Hong Kong. Lots of exciting projects of different sizes. Uh, there's no chance that we could board there at Zulke. And uh, yeah, we are hiring. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and so that's all from my side. My contact info is here, and I'll leave it open for questions. Thank you, Mark. So I think you did a great job in uh, uh, compressing your talk in the, the time frame. So we have uh, time for one or two questions. Any questions? Uh, thanks. It was, a, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I have to ask about uh, Seaboard. Uh, 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 I'm kind of forced. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, about a constrained binary object representation. Uh, no. well, I guess I am aware of it, but only this. All right. Like maybe you want to check seaboard.io and, and maybe if we want to check. I mean, I would like to know your opinion. I'll come back to that in the next talk. All right. <laughs> and, and thanks again. Any more questions? Um, 
software developer here. Well, uh, my professional work is web development, so I use actually um, also already proven buff, but in the context of uh, um, gRPC. So uh, my question to you, um, did you also take a look into gRPC and how uh, Google um, uses protobuf to, to, yeah, to extend uh, the specification with the service uh, um, stuff and um, using underlying uh, HTTP2? Um, my, my idea was friendly about, or did you consider to using that and um, moving it to the embedded space like using core or something? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, um, no, I haven't looked at that in a level of detail because to be honest for our project, it's a complex project, but it's more of a standard uh, device project that's really doesn't have a high level of connectivity to the outside. Like we were more focused on the connectivity within the device itself. Um, so that wasn't really necessary for this project. But can, definitely we can talk about it afterwards if you want to ask something. Okay, uh, thanks again. Yeah, I think we'll go over to Christian for the next talk. Thanks.